anti-racist author and educator Tim Wise tells a story about his college days in Louisiana. It was shortly after he moved into a house with nine other guys, which he reflects on not being the smartest idea, <laughs> that one of his housemates cooked a pot of gumbo, ate some of it, and left about half a pot of gumbo on the stovetop. And there it remained. For a night. For a day. For another night, by which time it had really begun to stink. The housemates still used the other three burners on the stove, <laughs> holding their noses. And people began to pass through the kitchen quickly on account of the smell. <laughs> Any mention of the reeking, filthy pot was met with declarations of innocence by the roommates. I didn't make the mess. It's not my fault. It's not my responsibility. And so the nasty, rotting pot remained producing what Tim Wise described as an unholy funk <laughs> that began to waft into the other rooms of the house. Tim Wise described the situation reaching a point, a point beyond guilt and innocence, beyond shame or blame, in which cleaning up the funky pot of gumbo on the stove became a social imperative simply because continuing to live that way was unthinkable. He may not have been responsible for the pot of gumbo, but now it was his responsibility. Tim Wise writes, it was at that point that I said to myself, I may not have made this mess, this may not be my fault, but I'm gonna clean it up because very simply put, I am tired of living in this fall. Two-day-old pot of nasty gumbo is a deeply flawed metaphor for the evils of the 400-year legacy of systemic racism in our country, obviously. White supremacy is not simply an unpleasant smell. It is often a matter of life and death. Witness the 50 Muslims murdered while praying in their mosque in New Zealand. Systemic racism does more than afflict the nostrils. It causes irreparable harm. Witness the children of Flint, Michigan, who will suffer the effects of lead poisoning throughout their entire lives. And systemic racism, as Marion said, cannot be eradicated as easily as one can scrub a pot clean. But on one level, at least, the metaphor works well at the level of explaining why a person like, like me might make a commitment to doing the work of learning about and committing to show up for racial justice. I may not have made the mess. I may be able to philosophize and pontificate on all the ways that it's not my fault. But all that and a dollar won't buy me a pot of coffee. Won't even buy me a cup. No, it is a mess that becomes my responsibility because taking responsibility is what it means to be an adult. So here is what reckoning, reckoning with white supremacy has looked like for me. Like Mary and I attended the Racial Equity Institute's training as a part of our staff team and found it to be worthwhile and engaging. For me, like Marion, it's meant being intentional about forming relationships. It's also meant incessantly reading books, dealing with the subject of racism, and it's meant expanding my reading to include more authors of color, expanding my media consumption to include more African-American and non-white voices, because I find that I am diminished when those voices, oh, when I'm not listening to those voices speaking, one commitment that I've made is to use my gifts, my privilege, in order to engage other white people about systemic racism. 
through the group, first through the group triangle, surge, surge stands up, stands for showing up for racial justice. I attended a series of trainings dealing with how white people can be more effective in talking about race with other white people. Marian's point about bringing things out in the open was definitely the case here. After attending those trainings, I was asked by the group to spend several days going door to door in a strategically chosen community, knocking on doors and asking the white people who answered to have a conversation with me about race and racism. I would not have signed up for this had I not been told that it's actually been proven to move the needle. That they actually did a bunch of people and had these conversations and then they went back six months later and found that the people who had engaged in the conversations actually had got something out of them and had actually made changes through them. Isn't that amazing? If this sort of thing is interesting to you, and we're not going to assign you to go door to door, <laughs> there is an event coming up on August, or sorry, on April 14th, that we are co-sponsoring with Kahila Synagogue. Community Church and Kahila is co-sponsoring a speaker named David Camp, who offers what he calls the White Allies Workshop, which deals with training white people to be more effective in conversations with other white people to promote racial justice. Another thing that I've done and that I reflect on quite a bit is that for the past two years, I've found myself serving as the chair and then the co-chair of the Religious Affairs Committee of the Chapel Hill Carborough NAACP. The branch president, Anna Anna Richards, had had some meetings trying to reorganize this group and, and I went to those meetings, and then at the end of one of these meetings, she decided to ask whether someone might like to step forward into leadership. <coughs> and there was a long, long, <laughs> long pause. <laughs> Many averted eyes. <laughs> and only after an extremely long pause, did I do what I said to myself I wasn't going to do when I attended that meeting, which is that I stepped forward and offered to be the temporary leader. <laughs> <laughs> Until a proper leader could be identified two years later. Two years later, there I am. It's been both one of the most satisfying as my, it was one of the most unusual leadership experiences of my life, for my role and my goal as a leader has been to take up as little space as possible and find ways to take up even less space than that. It's the only leadership role that I've ever taken where I categorically refuse to be the public face of the organization, insisting that someone else speak. I found myself on the committee that designed, or leading the committee that designed the last two town Martin Luther King Day services, and it's been the only two services in my life that I've designed without giving myself any speaking role. Just a role assistant off to the side. And it's also been a leadership goal of mine to in all ways promote the vision and the leadership of President Anna Richards in that organization. I've been inspired, as has Marion, by the folks in this congregation who I see leading in our community in ways far more impactful than I have. I want to lead you, leave you with a quote by James Baldwin. It's the quote with which I began the service this morning. Baldwin wrote, the world is before you, and you need not take it or leave it as it was when you came in. The world is before you, 
and you need not take it or leave it as it was when you came in. The world is before you. And even though this world that you came into, you did not make the mess that you inherited. Even though you may say that you're not responsible, that you're not responsible for the world that you've been given. You find that at the same time you are responsible. I find that I am responsible for what I can do about it. Beyond shame and beyond blame, beyond either guilt or innocence, is this truth that through our lives we have been given the gift. The gift to live, the gift to work, the gift to struggle, and the gift to bless. Amen. It's been a deep pleasure to share the pulpit with Mary. Amen and blessed be. And let us join in singing our closing hymn of the morning, number 151 in your great hymnal, I Wish I Knew How, and I invite you to rise in body, or in spirit, and to sing out.